Hi, uh, this tutorial uh, will go over creating this rock. It's a game ready PBR asset. Um, we'll go through the whole process. The workflow is starting with a base mesh, bringing that out of Maya into Mudbox. We sculpt increasing levels of detail in Mudbox. We export out a very high poly version for baking, but also a medium poly for Maya, which here lets us create a retopology model, which will be the in time, uh, real time in game model. We unwrap it, we'll bake it using XNormal, we'll go with Quixel in Photoshop to create some texture maps, uh, a little bit of texturing in Photoshop, um, but then we'll jump into Mudbox and do detail texturing using the PTEX uh, painting workflow inside of Mudbox, and then finally we'll bring it all into Unity and assemble the different uh, maps. This is just a super quick intro to Mudbox, for in case you're not familiar with it. Um, basically, I've got the environment set up to operate the same as Maya. Um, so I hold down the Alt key and left click to orbit, uh, middle click to pan, and right click to zoom in and out. Um, you want your sculpting brushes down here. Uh, for this tutorial, we're just using really the sculpt, the grab, um, some pinch, and definitely the scrape tool, uh, this one. Um, and really with Mudbox, it's about setting up, picking one of these brushes and just setting up the, uh, the various settings to be exactly what you're after. Um, to sculpt with it, it's simply a matter of dragging um, your brush. If you hold down control uh, on the keyboard, that pushes in and not just, just touching the clay, digital clay, will pull that out. If you hold down shift, that acts as the smooth tool. Um, shift D subdivides your model. So Shift D again, you can see down here the resolution and it's at a different uh, resolution level. So I can go page down to go through those levels and page up to go back up. Generally, the, generally though, you start at a lower setting, add as much detail as you need and then hit um, subdivide to go up to your other levels. Um, that's the fundamentals. Uh, hopefully that's all you need to get started. It's a very simple t um, program in terms of learning how to use it. Um, it's just a bit more powerful when we get into um, using the PTEX features to, to paint, which we'll do at the end of this video. Now, starting with a base mesh in Maya, pretty straightforward. It's just a subdivided cube. I'm exporting this into Mudbox. Now I've sped this part up. It's just a matter of the grab tool. I've subdivided. Uh, you can see where it says total at the bottom of the screen there. It's uh, 76,800 polygons. And I'm using the grab tool um, to reposition and, and create your basic shape that I'm after. I'm simply exploring the shape, trying to get um, the sort of column-like rock structure that I'm looking for. So now I've switched to the scrape tool. Um, it's pretty useful as a default tool for just smoothing out those edges and, and creating um, sort of sculptural-like um, hard edges. And uh, using the smooth tool, just want to smooth that out, get rid of the cube-like shape to it. And you can't really go wrong here. It's just experimenting, trying to get the right sort of shapes. I'm back in the grab, grab tool. Um, making sure that I'm happy with the generic mass, uh, the, the overall shape of it. You don't want to jump straight into detailing. You want to make sure you're happy with the shape before you move on. Now, uh, I'll slow the video down here. The scrape tool um, has a great setting for starting with a rock-like setting. If you, you select the scrape tool, turn on your stamp image and select this one here, um, cliffface.tiff. It's one of the default uh, mud box effects. We turned on randomize and the, the first one, the rotation slider, turn that right up. We scroll down, um, stamp spacing, if you hover over it, it's pretty obvious, it's self-explanatory how that works. Uh, we don't need snap to curve. The buildup you definitely want at maximum, which means it goes straight into full strength when you press. Um, I, I changed the um, fall off of the brush. I did actually set this back later. Um, this bit's very important. We need to select the in the advanced setting the direction to camera, which means whichever way we orbit around, um, the angle that the camera, 
that the object is facing towards the camera. When we press that, uh, it will paint in that direction. Just go into this little icon on the left and click Add and go down to Tool. And uh, simply rename this Scrape Hard because it's exactly what it is. It's, it's a scrape tool that's just a bit of a hard edge compared to the regular scrape tool. Now, I've just edited out some problems that I noticed that it wasn't working how I wanted it. Uh, the distance should be somewhere around 1520 um, for the stamp spacing. But I'm still getting these, these hard edges, which is the brush fall off um, because I played with that setting. It's too sharp, so I'll set it back to the default. You can see now it's it's still a very hard edge brush, um, but this actually creates a really strong rock-like effect. So a slightly smaller brush. Um, I have subdivided, by the way. This is an important thing to point out. Um, you'll notice down the bottom there, total is 307,000 polygons. So roughly around, um, let's say, two to 400,000 polys is, is about what you need for this tool. So I'll speed the video up here and you can just see the basic workflow. It's simply going over the entire object uh, with this hard scrape brush that we made and um, putting in this effect. You know, it kind of gives us a template. Um, remember to move the camera at a lot of different angles because as, as you can see, um, depending on where the camera is facing will de determine how hard that scrapes that that scrape brush um, works. So very experimental. Go through looking for some interesting shapes that work for you. Uh, if it doesn't work, just just keep on trying until you end up with something that's um, appropriate. Sometimes it'll, it'll, it won't work out and you have to hit the smooth. You'll see every now and then I'm smoothing and then going back in and adding more detail. Okay, so once we're finished, um, I'm going to the Sculpt tool and I'm using that geometry that I just created with my custom hard scrape brush um, as a guide. And I'm, I'm using the Sculpt tool and holding down Control here to push in and form some of the more larger shapes that, are, that I want. Um, just emphasizing. I'm hitting, uh, holding down shift to smooth out as I sculpt and then going back and adding more detail again. Uh, so obviously this video is sped up. You want to take your time with it and, and make sure you're happy with the, the shapes that you're after. Uh, if it doesn't work out, just try again. You know, this, it's just constantly experimenting with it. Just try a shape. If it doesn't work out, you can smooth it back out and jump back in and try again. Um, Trial and error. Being a tutorial video, I'm just sort of somewhat racing through, even even when it wasn't sped up. I was trying to go fairly quickly to get it um, done to illustrate the concept. Um, if you're after a high quality asset, you certainly would take your time. Okay, at this point, I'm using the pinch tool. Um, it's really useful for bringing in the sort of cracked edges, um, creating like a, a, a very common rock um, feature that we see in rocks, which is the, the two surfaces coming together. Um, it's actually caused by usually water damage that's, that's roll, rolling through the rock over eons. So you want to pull these, um, pinch these bits of geometry together to form these cracks. So it's okay starting with a nice wide crack to push in and then uh, use your pinch tool to bring those together. If you lose your detail, just grab the Sculpt tool and add a bit more detail back in, smooth it out, and then grab your Pinch tool and, and pinch them back in together. And also try different brush sizes. So especially with the Pinch tool, I'm, I'm going larger and smaller. You can see here I've jumped back to the Grab tool and now back to the Pinch tool again. If you feel like this, uh, it's not quite right, you can easily go back to a previous step and make minor changes, not a problem. And now because I've used the smooth tool so much, I'm, I'm just scraping in some extra detail. Okay, at this point, 
Um, I have subdivided again, so you can see I'm at about 1.2 million polys. And I'm using the stencil. So in the stencil tab, uh, I've selected this default um, stencil, which is quite nice for rock. Now straight away, I've, I've pressed a bit hard on the tablet, so I've just undone that. Um, you want to sort of ease in, make sure it's just somewhat subtle. You don't want to overdo your detail. So it's simply using the sculpt brush with your stencil set. I've sped the video up here so you can see the overall workflow. Um, so it's not too tedious watching me in real time sculpt this detail in. And obviously just pay attention to what those um, settings, those instructions on the screen say. Hold down S to move your stencil around. Hold down Q to hide it. You can see it's turning on and off constantly. Um, it's, it's really important with this sort of workflow to turn off your stencil and see uh, what you're doing and then turn it back on when you're ready. Okay, just finishing the detail now and I'm ready to export this. It's just a matter of going to select move tools and clicking on objects, which lets me select the whole mesh, going down to export selection. Now I'm exporting this out as my high poly, so HP for short for high poly in the name. That's what I'll use as my bake source. But in addition, I wanted a medium poly for Maya because the high poly is just too high resolution or crash Maya. Um, so I've gone page down to level two. And that's got the same shape, but it's uh, low enough resolution that I can work with it. So I'm just renaming this MP for medium poly. This is purely as a guide inside of Maya for my retopology. So we jump back to Maya and I'll import the, uh, the MP model, the medium poly. As we can see, this is um, it's high detail, but it, it's um, the system can handle it quite comfortably. So I've sped this section right up. It's very straightforward modeling. I'm just starting with a cube. There are a number of techniques for retopology. Um, you can use the, the new newish uh, modeling tools. Um, things like quad draw is very useful. And there's very common technique for retopology, uh, especially when you're talking about things like um, face structures or characters, where you really need uh, a very specific topology. Um, there's other tools such as the animation deformer um, shrink wrap, which is really useful. Um, but this way is a very common approach for a game asset where it's not a, a specific topology that you're after. You don't necessarily need certain edge loops going in certain directions to allow for nice deformation like you do with animation. All that matters is that we get the shape that we need. The shape needs to resemble the high poly model. So the, the most, basically what you're trying to do is make a real-time model that will run nice and smooth and efficient in game, but is somewhere in between, um, it's an average. It's an average between um, the, the high poly shape or the medium poly shape that we're working with and um, some sort of generic cube-like structure over the top. So I've modeled this. Um, I've just noticed that I'm miss missing my mesh tools. So if you go into um, polygons and the customize menu, you can add tool sets. So here's my mesh tool set. You can see that now appears up there next to the edit UVs. Um, I wanted the multi-cut tool. That's why I added that back in. Triangles are fine. Uh, we don't need to work in quads. We're not smoothing this. This is a real-time asset. It will be tessellated, which means converted into triangles uh, when it's rendered in game anyway. So we don't care about triangles. We do care about um, n-gons because we'll have issues with that when we try to bake n-gons. Um, I did find a couple in this mesh, which I cleaned up um, when I wasn't recording the video. Now you'll notice that I'm extruding out these shapes. Um, it's because I'm after key shapes that will really stand out in game.
So when we see the object from the side, um, or if we were to look at the silhouette, which I'll do shortly by turning the lights off in Maya, um, you want to be able to see these large obvious shapes. And of course I'm trying to model um, the generic shapes of the overall large mesh. So the high poly mesh or medium poly mesh um, has certain shapes, um, bulges sticking out of it. So I'm just creating a bit of extra geometry, um, extruding that out to make sure that it's, it, it conforms to those shapes. You can see where um, I've got that medium poly mesh um, on layer one in template mode. Um, so it's giving me that wireframe. And you can see how the, the retopology, the in-game model I'm making is um, intersecting with it through various points in the model. Uh, so you're seeing those sort of pool-like shapes where it's um, parts of it are a low poly model sticking out and other parts are the medium poly. That's very much what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to get an intersection. So turning off the lights and orbiting around is very important with a, a low poly in-game asset. Um, you really want to see um, a strong silhouette. Uh, this is key, especially for low poly assets like this one. Um, you know, higher poly assets, we can get away with a lot of detail um, in the geometry, which will create the shapes we're after. Uh, but for low poly assets like this, it's really quite important that uh, we're extremely efficient in communicating the overall shape and value of the object. Um, we don't want to rely purely on the texture. We want to make sure that geometry um, really looks like the, the generic shape that we're after. Of course, being a rock, um, we want this to be fairly efficient and low poly because rocks typically will be duplicated a lot. Um, then far from being a, a hero asset in the game, it's not like the main character that could, you know, in a current gen system, be upwards of 50,000 polys quite comfortably. Um, or environments, these days uh, you're getting massive poly counts in environments. Yet, if you're talking about something, a gigantic game, um, having rocks littered around the place um, of this sort of style would be crazy um, to, to have them high poly when you can really get away with quite a strong effect um, just with the use of, of maps and some efficient modeling. So I think that's about done. Final check of the silhouette. I want to make sure uh, that's a very strong silhouette that reads clearly and obviously checking the two shapes to make sure that they're approximating each other and they're very close to each other. You can see the um, problem with the hard edges. So going to normals and soften edge gets rid of the faceting that was happening from all those extrusions. Now I'm going to add a Lambert and a file uh, because we're ready to texture, sorry, to unwrap. So I'm adding that, middle click dragging it onto the color map, double clicking the file and loading the checker texture that I like to use. Just onto a Lambert, middle click drag that onto the object and so we can see that it's not unwrapped at all. So I'll open up the UV texture editor Very straightforward object to, to unwrap this one. Simply select it. Um, I always like to start with create UVs based on camera, simply because it gives you no seams. It's one entire object. It's just a matter of doing that and then selecting exactly where you want your seams. So I'll go into edge mode now. I'm going to unwrap this um, pretty much like a baseball. If that makes any sense, you'd probably need to look at an image of a base, baseball to understand what I'm talking about. Um, so I'll speed this up a little bit. If I go through here, selecting the edges, 
um, in a similar sort of style as, as a, how the seam on a baseball works. One long flow, um, I've decided uh, this vertical edge loop here is, is preferable. Now I'll just make sure that's a continuous uh, selection there, because that's exactly what I'm after. I'm simply splitting this object into two, um, but instead of straight down the middle, it's a little bit lopsided. So I click the scissors, which is our uh, Um, sorry, cut edges tool. I'm selecting a single UV and holding down control and going to shell, which lets me separate them. Now I'm scaling them up. The unfold tool, for some bizarre reason, uh, works really well if you scale things up. It, it works completely differently when they're scaled up as it does when they're scaled down. So just as a, a habit, I always, always scale them up. So I click unfold and that just sort of collapses in um, and goes small, but yeah, so they're unfolding reasonably well. And scaling down. And just position them in the 0, 1 space, which is the upper right square. Very important that all of our uh, textures are only in the 0, 1 space. Um, everything else outside of that 0, 1 space is mirrored. And that will give us a lot of problems um, with our normal map. If, if they're not in that 0, 1 space. Now, looking at this object... Um, it's not a terrible unwrap, but there's definitely some distortion that I'm not too happy with. So at the moment I'm just sort of positioning them, positioning them in the zero one. one But um, what I want to do is turn on my seams. So if you go into the display, polygons, uh, texture border edges, and then Tech, uh, edge width, it highlights where the seams are, the UV seams, which is a useful way to see what you're doing. Um, I can see at the bottom there, it's also happening on the top, the caps, um, it's different, definite obvious distortion happening in there. So I'll try to fix that first um, with just uh, unfolding just those sections of UVs. So we'll just go into UV mode and select uh, a small portion of it. And I'll just have a quick go at unfolding and see if I have any luck. And UV wrapping and unfolding is a little bit of an experimental process. Um, the more you do it, the, the more sort of intuitive it becomes. So it, it kind of worked a little bit, um, but it's, it's far from perfect. There's definitely distortion in there. So I've decided I'll just go through here and split these seams. Well, add some seams, so I split the, the UV edges there. Select a single UV, hold down control to shell, so that brings out my shell separately. And now if I unfold that, uh, that's going to be perfect because it's only those four quads. You can see down there that's a perfect unwrap, unfold. And now I need to unfold the rest of this object because now that it's separated, it will behave differently. So we can see there in the viewport, that's uh, quite a nice clean unfold. And I'll do the same with the top piece. I'll just um, insert some edge loops. I'll select my edge and then uh, cut those seams and unfold. I've decided I'm not happy with that selection. We want to go along the top section. Just trying to choose where I want to cut these. Click the scissors. Select a single UV, two shell. Unfold. Uh, we're out of range of the rec recording screen there, but uh, it's the exact same process that I just did on the, the bottom section. Um, I really like using a UV texture sheet, this, um, this checker texture, uh, like this one that has text on it, uh, makes it very easy to see whether your UVs are flipped. You should be able, able to always read those, um, the text. If they're mirrored, then there's a problem. Um, so that's, that's a downside of just the generic black and white checker. 
you cannot tell just from that if they're flipped or not. Um, I find the little circles and squares combined help make it more obvious if you're getting distortion as well. Okay, so that's unwrapped. Now I'm ready to export this model. And um, actually, I'm just unfolding this top section. Uh, the scale was a bit off. It was a little lower resolution than the rest of it. We needed to increase that. Make sure your checkers are about the same size as each other. I've got the same problem with the, the lower shell. So I'll just scale that up a little bit. So now the resolution's about the same on all of them. Uh, you can just eyeball that, and as long as they look about the same, then it'll, it'll look about right in-game. Um, if there's an obvious difference, though, it'll be obvious in-game you'll get pixelation. So we're fin finished with the unwrap, and it's a matter now of we want to get clean the scene up, basically. We have to delete all the history, so I've just gone in Edit Delete All History, so we can see we have no nodes in the channel box. And I've just gone Modify Freeze Transformations, we don't need any values there. Make sure this pivot is centered. If I turn on the um, other model, the re reference model, we can see that it's still occupying the same space. And one last thing is, let's just check we don't have any uh, n-gons, so five or more sided polygons. So if you select in the cleanup UVs, uh, sorry, cleanup options, select matching, it's very important that you don't select change, just the select and uh, when you run that with more than uh, four-sided faces, it'll select them for you. And here we found uh, an N-Gon. A quick fix with the multi-cut tool. Um, basically, if you have any N-Gons in your model and you bring them into um, X-Normal, it won't be happy. It'll, it'll t give you an error, tell, it, tell you to go fix it. So now we're done. We can export this as our low-poly. Now this should be an OBJ. Um, for X normal. So LP for low poly. Here in X, X normal, it's just a matter of selecting your high definition meshes, just clear meshes if you had any previously loaded. Right click add meshes and select our high poly. So it says there high definition. So I select our HP. I'm just using the default uh, settings for this. The low poly, clear whatever we had, add meshes, and not the MP, it's the LP. And the baking options. I'm going to bake a normal map and an ambient occlusion map. So select where you want to save it and call it just the name. It'll automatically append that with the name uh, either normal or ambient, or occlusion, whatever. Um, again, I'm using the default settings. You can experiment with these if uh, you're not happy with the result, but um, often the default settings work pretty well. And once you're all done, click Generate Maps. I'll just turn the anti-aliasing up. Now we'll edit to once that's finished rendering. It's actually quick to render anyway, but uh, not quite as quick as that edit. So there's our ambient occlusion and the normal. So we'll open these in Photoshop. So these two maps, ambient occlusion. Um, it's a bit bright, I just want to make some adjustments. If we go into the hue saturation, I can pull down the lightness a little. It's just a little bit bright for what I want. Let's uh, take a look at the levels. Pull it down a little bit. I just want to focus a bit more on those darker colors um, and kill off some of the lighter. So most of the data is definitely down in the light end, obviously. And by pulling these sliders, we can push the darkness right up. And it's quite useful to increase the, the shading of our textures. Just be aware with the PBR, the physics-based rendering workflow, which is all the, the craze with the current generation of, of rendering in games. Um, you shouldn't be baking too much shadow into your texture. Um, I've definitely done a bit of shadowing into this. It's a bit of an old, older approach. Um, so just be aware of that with PBR. It's designed to mimic the real world with physics. Uh, I'm just using the curves here. 
basically the curve lets you hold the data down um, one spectrum uh, a bit longer before the data gets too high. So here we are in Quixel Suite um, and do two. So I've got the normal map and I've clicked ambient occlusion and clicked activate. Once that's rendered, um, this is what we get. These sliders, this is a real time um, um, setting. I can, I can use these sliders um, to procedurally change the various settings of these layers that it's generated. Now it's giving me quite a metallic look. So I want to make some adjustments. So first I'll flatten the image by going layer, flatten image, then go into image adjustments. As usual, it's just a bit of experimentation. I'm hoping to get a bit of a specular map out of this. So it definitely needs to be darker. Um, so here's a texture. And I'm actually going to use this uh, metallic base as, as the, a base for the texture. Now, um, this sort of stone texture uh, doesn't quite cover the image, so I'm going to use the stone uh, clone stamp tool. This tool is just a matter of holding down Alt, set, set the brush size you want, hold down Alt, uh, and it lets you sample a section of the image. So I'm sampling up here, and then when I release Alt and start brushing, you can see in the upper section it's it's sampling and in the lower section it's brushing on that sample so it's a great way to increase the size of a, a texture uh, only problem of course is you end up sampling um, if you if you just do it in a linear sort of way it, it becomes very repetitive so you want to make sure you go through and sample various areas and get rid of any sort of obvious repetition going on Looking back at this, I probably should have gotten rid of um, some of the more obvious repetitive areas. Uh, there's a couple of big stones and things that stand out a little bit too much. Um, but overall, it's, this texture seems to work pretty well. Now, I'll set that to light, lighten blend mode and turn the opacity down a little bit. So that lets that sort of metallic um, ambient occlusion texture that, uh, layer that we made in Endu uh, come through. I'll save this out, PNG, so it's ready for Unity. Now, to start with, this is my diffuse channel. Uh, I will come back to this later uh, and add a lot more detail using Mudbox. Uh, I'll just save out my normal map as a PNG using the same naming convention, so rock underscore NRM for normal. Okay, so here we are in Unity. Just going to import these. Right click, import asset. We want to bring in simply the diffuse and the normal map. So the two textures and also the actual model itself. So I've brought in those three. Here's the low poly model. Should always zero things out when you bring them into um, any 3D world. Make sure they're in the world origins. Just a good habit. So to start with, uh, I'm creating a material. I just want to add the diffuse and normal map and see how we're going with it. So I plug that into the albedo. I'm just using the Unity 5 standard shader. We can see it's very metallic looking. It's got a lot of reflection going on. I'll change that to the specular setup. Now I've clicked the albedo color, um, and by going to a darker color, I'm, I'm pulling that color back. You can see if I go completely down, we lose all color, and we're only seeing the specular highlight and the base color. Um, so I'm, I'm reducing the amount. Now, without putting any color in the specular, you can see what I do when I move the smoothness shader. It makes it look either metallic or completely flat. And this is a fundamental concept of the PBR workflow. Um, you used to use a specular map 
purely to describe the reflectiveness and in, uh, in the specular highlights of an object. Um, that's no longer the case. We're concerned with um, uh, metallicness. Here I've added the normal map. Uh, we've definitely got some issues on that normal map. It looks a bit like elephant skin. Um, to start with, I've just turned it down. I'll uh, fix that shortly. So this little slider here just before, just after the word normal map and before the, the setting, you can drag that as an invisible slider there. Uh, it lets you turn the strength of the normal map up or down. Um, back in Photoshop, I just want to export out this uh, ambient occlusion as a, an occlusion texture. So bring that into Unity, the AO. For the time being, please ignore the height map. I, I cut out a section of the video where I created the height map. Um, the height map didn't work very well on this, so you'll see shortly there's a problem that I noticed and I deleted it. But the occlusion um, is, is increasing the sense of depth for the recesses, uh, which is very nice. We get the, a lot more shadowing happening in the, the various recesses that we've created. Um, what's happening at the moment, I'm orbiting around and seeing mild distortion on the, the perimeters of the object. Uh, it's not super obvious in this video, um, but you can definitely see it when you um, have the, the screen resolution up fairly high. Uh, and I'm also concerned about this elephant skin that we're seeing on the normal map. It's quite pixelated and looking a bit bizarre. So I can try playing with the settings, um, but clearly the smoothness slider, all that's doing is making it look more metallic. You can see up actually in the top right there, um, as that orbits around, we're seeing a little bit of distortion, uh, which is caused by the height map. So let's kill the height map. Kill it. I think I just deleted it. That's the height map. Um, like I said, I did not uh, include in the video how I created that. I just used uh, Quixel. So we delete that. There's no need for it. Still not happy with the normal map, um, so let's you see I'm experimenting. At this point, I'm I'm just kind of scratching my head um, why I'm getting such a bad normal map. Uh, it's because of the way I imported it. We can see here when I click it, it's very pixelated. Um, I'm just deleting it and re-importing it, and I'm letting Unity uh, decide how it should be in imported. So by default, that's come through quite nicely. If I select my material and drag it in there, it gives me this warning, this texture is not marked as a normal map. Fix now. We click Fix now, and it automatically converts it to a normal map, sets it as a normal map, um, but it actually does a good job this time. So if you get a problem, try just uh, deleting the, the texture and bring it, bringing it back in uh, can work out. So turning the strength up of the normal map and um, it's a much better effect. It's certainly better than that elephant skin that we had. We can see the, the various bump detail coming through quite nicely. Uh, it's definitely looking like a much higher poly asset, uh, higher quality. You could leave it at this. You could uh, call that done. It's not too bad. Um, but I like to see more detail in my textures. And Mudbox gives us some cool tools for uh, adding a lot of detail. So let's just take this a bit further and uh, play with P-Text in Mudbox. Open up a new scene in Mudbox nothing in it, and just import our low poly model. So not the high poly sculpt, but the actual low poly in-game model. If you turn the wires on, you can hit W on the keyboard to turn the wires on and see 
This is our low poly game asset. We're not going to be sculpting, so don't subdivide at all. Um, select your layers tab and then make sure the paint tab is set. And we'll make a new layer to start with. Uh, what we're going to do is import our uh, diffuse and our normal maps. So on that new layer, right click and go down to import layer and uh, select your diffuse. You can see there's a few experiments I've done in that folder. I've, I've got like three or four diffuse maps that I've already made. Uh, so import your diffuse texture. That's going to be um, a reference point as well as our normal map. So I've made another layer, import layer normal. Make sure you set this one from this pull down menu as a normal map. And you'll see uh, Mindbox gives us quite a nice render of the normal and diffuse maps combined. Uh, so that's our, our reference. That's what we're going to use um, to guide as we paint to make sure that we're um, getting the details we want in the right places. So we're using these paint tools, not the sculpt tools. I've made a new layer. And I'm going to start by selecting a color. Now th this, what I'm doing here is a highlight, uh, but I don't want an extreme white. Um, it's it's kind of like a base highlight, so more of a, a dirty, stony kind of color. Um, so really want us, I want something warm and a little bit orange, um, kind of an off-white. And the idea is I'll do one pass of highlight layer um, coloring, and then I'll do another light pass with um, a lighter color of just finer coloring. So we can see here on that paint layer, make sure on the right there the paint layer is at the top. You can just drag that layer to the top. Um, otherwise the diffuse map will cover over it. You won't see what you're doing. So we're painting on top of that layer. I'm just going through with my tablet. It's very important, I think, to use a, uh, a graphics tablet. I'm using a Wacom Intuos um, Pro. And just going through lightly, um, nice light strokes. You want to be somewhat subtle on this. Uh, it's very easy to overdo it. Uh, and be aware that in Mudbox, it renders differently. And if you um, make it very obvious where your highlights are in Mudbox, it might come through uh, a little bit too obvious in Unity. It's worth doing a few saves. Um, that's why earlier, if you notice when I brought in my diffuse map, I had four diffuse maps. Uh, it's because I did several saves out of Mudbox and tested it in Unity um, to make sure that I was happy with the look that I went for. Um, so I did a little adjusting and, and these are the colors that I've picked and the sort of level of, um, of intensity of, of that opacity that I'm painting on. So what I'm going through is um, using that normal map as a reference, um, picking the things that look like heightened, uh, elevated sections of the model and uh, just lightly painting in. Obviously this is very sped up. Um, significantly sped up. You want to take your time with this, don't rush it. Now, once I'm happy with that, I'm making another new layer. Um, I'll rename this one Highlights. And we'll pick a lighter color, um, pretty much a white. Maybe not completely white, but uh, close to it. Now on top of that, we'll scroll down and I want a brush. Um, so I'll come to the stamp image, turn that on and go to my stamp tabs. And um, I've picked this sort of scattered brush. It's like a bit of a spray. Um, I'll turn on randomize and increase that a little and you'll see what that does when I, I paint here. It sort of does this scattered um, chalky kind of look. So we'll turn the brush down and um, the idea here is I'm, I'm trying to go over adding uh, highlights, small highlights to the previous layer that I just did of highlights. So it's, it's kind of like doing highlights on top of highlights. Um, but it's important to get those two different color variations as well. So that's a warmer orange color that I've added helps. Uh, one thing to point out here is the diffuse layer that I've brought in. Um, the original diffuse texture, uh, which is the, the third layer down in that layers window there. Um, that's set to 23 at the moment. I've turned that right down. There's a little slider to the right of it. Um, 
by turning that down, it's made it a bit easier to see exactly what I'm painting on to this, this new layer. Um, at the end of this, I'll, I'll turn it right back up to see the end result. But if you have it, if you're doing this while that's at maximum um, 100%, it's, it's quite difficult to see the effect that you're having and you can easily overdo it. And like I said, it's, it's, it is important to be subtle to get a nice texture. So there we go, we turn it back up. It's uh, full strength, quite a lot of detail there. Um, you know, it's subtle, but we're getting uh, a lot more popping of the um, highlights of the rock. Okay, the next thing I want to do is add some uh, sort of grungy moss. And I'm going to use a stencil. So select the stencil tab and this little arrow, go add stencil. And I've got this um, moss-like texture. To use this, um, first I'll add a new layer. So I want to make sure that I'm texturing on top and there's a whole separate layer. Um, at the end of this, we'll export this out into Photoshop and it'll actually give us separate layers for each one. Uh, and we want to use the projection tool in our paint tools. So projection, so you can see it gets colored now. So it's just the same with the sculpt, the way we did our uh, detailing. Just move your texture around. Uh, don't be too heavy handed with your brush on the tablet and just start sculpting in detail. Um, I'm just turning the opacity of it down. I, I'm actually experimenting. Uh, there's kind of no point doing that because all it does is hide. Um, so I'm, I've turned it back up again. It, it's the strength um, on the brush is what you should be adjusting. And it's a kind of experimental process here. Um, initially, so you can see it disappeared. You've got to make sure that is actually on. So when you hit Q, hide stencil, it won't be texturing. It won't be projecting the stencil. Uh, initially, the idea, I was going to just add a lot of moss to the cracks. Um, but the more I experiment, experimented with it, the more I decided I wanted to have a fair bit of moss all over the object. Um, I was pretty happy with the effect it was giving me. Uh, the texture is from cgtextures.com from the, um, I think it was like a grime section or it might have been grunge or something similar. Looks like a photo of uh, some moss on a metal wall. Um, you you want to be experimental with your textures. You don't want to just think, well, I'm making rock, so I'm only going to look at rock references for texturing. You know, in this case, I'm trying to get um, the effect of or the illusion of, of moss, but who cares where that comes from? If that comes from a um, dirty old grungy wall somewhere and it does the job, then great. Um, you know, think outside the box a little, uh, outside the box a little bit, um, or even better, grab a camera and go out and take some real photos um, to source your textures. You kind of want to be building a texture library as a, as a game artist, it's pretty important. So this is very haphazard, this workflow. There's, there's nothing particular um, to tell you about. I'm just going through throwing um, the moss projection on all over the place. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the sort of vertical streaks to get that grimy uh, as, if, as if it's been in the rain a lot and it's had a lot of um, moisture dripping down vertically over the rock and causing moss to appear. Um, I'm filling it in in the the darker crevices of the the model. Some areas I'm trying to go very subtle and light with it, and other areas um, intentionally trying to overdo it a little bit, as if it's it's sort of overgrown with this sort of mossy kind of streaks of grime, whatever it is. Obviously the video's sped up significantly here. Just make sure you spend your time um, being careful, doing exactly what you want. You can see I'm orbiting around a lot. I'm zooming in and out. I'm constantly turning that uh, stencil off and on because I want to be observing the big picture, pulling away from it, um, taking a look at all the different angles, turning it back on, adding bits that I think are missing. You're constantly observing uh, your work from different angles. Okay, so once I'm finished, I'm exporting this 
right click, merge channel. Make sure you rename this to a PSD uh, because we're exporting it as a Photoshop file. If we bring it into Photoshop, we'll see it even gives us our UVs. It's quite nice what it gives us. Um, so I'll just hide those. Um, it's pretty much done. There's just a few minor changes I feel the need to do here. Um, nothing dramatic, but I think the moss, both the moss and the highlights are a little bit overdone. So it's always, I'm always cautious about, you know, you, you want to be subtle with everything. So I think just turn the opacity down a little is really all we need to do here. I did try a couple of layers. Um, darkening the moss was interesting, but um, I think it works best just on the normal setting. Incidentally, there are actually blending modes inside of those paint layers that we were using in Mudbox. So you can uh, go quite, quite extreme with your texturing process inside of Mudbox. It's almost like Photoshop the way it works. It's really cool. So I'm happy with this um, file, save as, uh, it's my new diffuse PNG. I deleted some of those experiments I had earlier and just replacing the initial one. I'll call this diffuse two. Um, I've done that because I want to compare the two. I want to compare the first one that I had to this new one and just see how they are different. So here we are in Unity. It's simply a matter of making a new shader with the exact same textures, except that diffuse is um, the new diffuse two. You can see a um, significant difference. So we'll get rid of that old one, there's no need. And really that's the finished asset. That's um, a PBR a physics based rendering workflow in Unity 5 using the Unity 5 standard shader. Um, pretty cool. I'd like to spend a bit more time in the sculpting stage to um, it's studying rock reference and get a, a better looking rock, but um, look, that's the whole workflow and it's, it's pretty solid. Uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe to the video and comment if you have any questions. Cheers.